Lords and ladies, I come bearing extremely, exceptionally important news regarding Baldur's Gate 3. And I want to say at the outset that nothing I'm about to talk about is meant as harmful criticism. Because I'm about to talk about cut content. And the reality is, is that when you make a game, and I'm not a developer, but we all know when you make a game, there are some things, many things, that end up on the cutting room floor because of time constraints and other constraints, and that's just the reality of things. So what I'm going to talk about is a list of confirmed cut content that a Redditor, a very, very diligent and talented Redditor, compiled due to his own data mining efforts. His name is Vaskaroth, and I'm going to read what he said on his own Reddit post because I think it has huge ramifications for the future of the game. I've been working on compiling cut content data mined from various sources for a while. And while I had a ton of this information in my other thread, I decided to forego the review or the complaints and simply list off the cut content that had been confirmed thus far. Larian always does this with their games and always restores the cut content almost exactly one year later. Do with that information what you will. But if you look at their last three games, you'll see Divinity Original Sin 2, Definitive Edition, Divinity Original Sin Enhanced Edition, and Divine Divinity Director's Cut. So Definitive Edition is very important, something we need to talk about at the end of the video. But let's talk about the cut content first, because it is a lot. And it explains a lot of the things that some of us have observed when we were playing the game. Things that either radically departed from what we had come to expect in early access, or things that were just flat out missing and seemed to be just not there. So we'll begin with companions. Companions are very important. And let's be honest, Carlac is the companion that disappoints us the most. With her ending of die or go back to Avernus, or alternatively become a mind flayer, there are not a lot of options for Carlac. And in some ways she seems very much slapped on, in a way that the other companions, permanent companions, do not. Well, lords and ladies, I think we have an explanation for this. Carlac's ending. Data mine content shows that not only did Carlac have a full ending, where her infernal engine was fixed and that she survived, but that most of it was fully voiced and complete. However, it requires triggers from the upper city portion of Baldur's Gate, and when that was cut, so was Carlac's Act 3 storyline. What we have left over has been confirmed to be Carlac's fail state endings, which were meant to only play if the player neglected her quest chain. Now, this obviously ties into the upper city as well which is something that is lacking in the game, and Baldur's Gate 3, as you probably know, has an upper city, a lower city, and an outer city. And we'll talk a little bit more about the lack of an upper city in a bit, because this is covered as well. But for those of us who've observed that Carlac seems to be lacking, this is the reason. Because she had a whole bunch of content that was cut, which is why she gets burn and die, become a mind flayer, or go back to Avernus, which she absolutely hates as an ending. Very dissatisfying. Ultimately. Next we have up Minthara, and Minthara is an option if you decide to slaughter the Druid Grove, and she is very lacking. She has no approval, she doesn't really add a whole lot to the game, and she doesn't really comment much. Well, this too has a reason behind it. Minthara was meant to have a much deeper story, including a pregnancy. These were likely cut due to Minthara being a late-stage addition to her roster, but dialogue lines remain in the game files that show that not only did Minthara have a lot more content for herself, but your other companions had a lot more to say about it. And again, in the current state, if you take Minthara with you, it's just a very bare-bones experience. It isn't that interesting. There's some stuff, and ultimately this is part of the issue with going the evil route. If you do not side with the druids, you lose out on content, it's a lot less interesting, and I have to say the evil route in Act 1 is just not very satisfying. So more Minthara content would be amazing, if possible. And now we come to Halson, and I think this is a consistent thread with these later add-on characters, because they join the party later, so almost necessarily they have less content to offer, less to say. But nonetheless, Halson's story. Another late addition to the roster, Halson was originally intended to have a great deal more endgame content involving the Druid Circle, but this appears to have been cut more early on than some of the other items thus far. And apparently there was a romancing Jahira option, which is a little bit weird to me. But you were able to romance Jahira, who is a very old woman by now. That's kind of strange. I'm not too bothered by the fact that that content was cut. Regarding your companions in the Illithid Parasite. Well, this was originally handled differently. 
Originally, companions were meant to accept or refuse illithid gifts independently of the player choice. You could, of course, influence them to decide who did and did not take the offered gifts, but ultimately, it would be based on individual character choices. This can still be seen in the game as a bug when companions will awaken after a long rest and will have claimed to have received a gift from their guardian and yet will have received no actual power. I'm not sure I feel about this in particular. This thing doesn't disturb me terribly much. But on the other hand, the idea of companions having very much a fixed personality and adhering to what they think is best in their gut does make a lot of sense and maybe it would have been a better choice to have in the game. More companion stuff. Apparently Minsk was meant to be recruitable at the end of Act 1, but it was cut and was pushed back later to the game. I think that would have been a nice addition. Everyone likes Minsk. Not a bad thing at all. Now here's something that we can regret. Act 3 companion dialogue. It seems that a lot of dialogue was cut. If you notice that companions have much less to say at the end of their journey, it's because thousands of their lines of dialogue were cut in the final act, and all for various reasons. This also seems to be the source of most of the companion bugs that only appear in the final act, as they're still trying to trigger events that simply no longer exist. So more companion content is almost always a good thing, so I think we definitely missed out on this, and it's a shame we lost this. And finally, in general, and even in Act 1, thousands of lines of dialogue and companion events were cut from the final game. Some of them were fully voiced and ready to be implemented in the game, but also reference other content that ended up on the cutting room floor. So a lot of companion stuff went missing, which is a shame because that's just more interactivity, that's just more developing a relationship with the companions, and so on and so forth. So now we're going to move on to maps. And maps are important because maps add new content to the game. And there seem to be three principal things that were cut from the final game. You have a Nautiloid map, which states that a large portion of the Nautiloid tutorial zone was cut in the final release, including cutscenes, dialogue, areas, and an optional fight with two injured imps. This was likely cut for the sake of brevity more than anything. And we know this from early access. We remember the Nautiloid ship being quite different, more expansive, and... I'm not sure how I feel about this. Maybe Larian just wanted us to get off the ship and start the game right away, but I kind of missed having that additional content on the Nautiloid, to be perfectly honest. This next one was much more important and ties into the cut content for Carlac, very unfortunate, Upper City of Baldur's Gate. And the author states this is the most obvious one in terms of maps being cut. Sven himself talked about the affluent Upper City just two weeks before launch and described it as being fully explorable and yet it's very noticeably absent from the final game. Which again explains the problem of Karlak, Herendian, and many, many other things that kind of went haywire in Act 3, to be perfectly honest. This final cut content, in my opinion, is probably the most interesting, and it is about Avernus, the first layer of the Nine Hells. An entire area of the game, Avernus was meant to be fully explorable, and of similar size to the Underdark area of Act 1, which would have been amazing. It would be a source not only for soul coins, but other rare materials, highly difficult fights, and special content for Karlak. So this would have been truly amazing, and in my earlier prognostications before release, I almost assumed Avernus would be a place to explore just because it was so intimately tied with the beginnings of the game, Tiamat, the Githyanki, you name it. This is a true tragedy because the Underdark is one of my favorite places to explore. Completely optional, and yet there's so much cool stuff going on there and it's just really enjoyable. Having it in the Nine Hells to explore would be truly amazing, and there's a lot more to say about that at the end of this video. But I first want to focus on summarizing all the things that are missing at the moment. So that's it for the maps, and to be perfectly honest, I would welcome a return of all of those things, including a more expansive, extended Nautiloid exploration, but that's just me. Now on to various story cuts, and most of these stand on their own, so I'll talk about them individually. Regarding Tav, Tav, the Dark Urge, a lot of people were both surprised and excited to see the addition of the Dark Urge Origin as the boss bomb evil option that was missing from EA. As it turns out, Tav was originally the Dark Urge, and they were all one origin. Tav was meant to be a boss bomb, and separating the two seemed to be what caused the narrative divide between the Dead 3 storyline and the Mind Flayer plot. Now, I'm not sure exactly what went on here, 
but my best guess would be that Larian wanted to offer more options to the players, as in, you can play your own personal customized story and not be tethered to being a ball spawn. But here's the Darkers too, and if you really want, you can be this really evil, murderous character, and it's up to you. I actually think that this in particular was a good decision on the part of Larian, to be perfectly honest. Now, many of you might remember Daisy from Early Access, and that was the Illithid simulation lover in your dream. And it was completely different from what we got, which was The Guardian. It's not a secret that Daisy was cut from the game after the last EA release and replaced with a Guardian. Originally, Daisy was representative of the tadpole in your head, not the Emperor, and would attempt to seduce your character into staying in the meadow by the river with her forever. A happy life with an imaginary dream lover while your body underwent seromorphosis and was lost to you forever. Daisy was such an important part of the plot that both of the game's theme songs, Down by the River and The Power, are based entirely upon Daisy. Data My Content also shows there was originally an ending where players would embrace a romance with Daisy and give themselves over to the parasite, forever leaving their individual consciousness down by the river with Daisy. I'm not sure how I feel about this particular one. I think The Guardian is reasonably well done. Overall, I have some criticisms I might make in a future video. But overall, I think I prefer The Guardian. Now, this next one ties into the Daisy story, namely the consequences of tadpole use. There were originally meant to be more severe consequences from using the Illithid powers too heavily and investing too much into the tadpole powers. This seems obvious in-game, and yet ultimately goes nowhere as the ending is reduced to about four choices made in the last leg of the game, you can use all the tadpole powers and receive the same ending regardless. Yes, I think there probably should be consequences for using the tadpole power, and in a sense, there sort of are, in as much as you can actively, consciously make the decision to become an illithid. The inner powers especially are just freebies. You can use them and not worry about anything. And I think that should be more consequential. If you're going to embrace the powers of the Parasite, there should be some kind of consequence to it, story-wise, and also gameplay-wise, ultimately. Some more broad story-cut content here, Orin and the Dragon. Orin was originally meant to corrupt a Githyanki Red Dragon, leading to a boss fight against a Slayer Formesque Dragon, which would have been really cool. I think something like this might be very much related to level caps and issues regarding level caps. More on this at the end of the video. Another non-specific thing, multiple cutscenes that were present for Act 1 are missing in the final game. And Cazador's story. Well, Cazador, the vampiric master of Astarian, was intended to have a lot more relevance in the game. If you notice in-game, Cazador is just a plot device. He's not really even an NPC for the most part. He's like a character made of cardboard, right? Like a cardboard cutout. Just seems to be power hungry, selfish, evil to the core, and that's about it. Well, according to this, originally Cazador was meant to play a huge role in the upper city. Again, we're missing the upper city of Baldur's Gate, including being a huge political power. Data mine content also shows that originally he was meant to be a potential ally in the final push against the Absolute. So much more interesting, much less of the cartoonish, oh, I'm an evil guy, I'm gonna kill all these people to gain ultimate power. Sure, that can be in there, but having multiple layers to this character. Because let's be honest, Cazador is a very disappointing NPC in the game. I just don't think he's very interesting. And probably in my opinion, the most important story cut content is the cut content of the Raven Queen. There was an entire second part of the storyline that was cut out early on, the Raven Queen. And the Raven Queen is this mysterious figure entity even, associated with the Shadowfell. It's rumored she used to be a powerful elven sorceress, but her history is lost to memory. And she plays a very important role. She gathers memories, she collects memories, and really nobody understands her motivations. But she exists in the Shadowfell in a place called the Fortress of Memories. It's a place filled with sadness, sorrow, and memories that were stolen from either mortals or dead gods. And the Raven Queen is basically a semi-divine figure associated with loss and tragedy. It seems to have a lot in common with Shar, in fact. But she has a much more neutral bent and doesn't appear to be as malicious as Shar. The fact that such a powerful and interesting entity was originally in the game and cut is a real shame, and I would love to see that restored if possible. Now on to my favorite part, cut content regarding the gods. Shar worship. In early access, the player was able to select Shar as a deity with its own unique dialogue trees, especially when interacting with Shadowheart as a fellow Shar worshiper, despite the fact that voice lines were data mined indicating this had functions well into Act 2, it was ultimately cut when the game launched. 
That certainly would have made the Shadow Heart questline a lot more interesting overall, and I think would have meshed well as a conflict of interest within the Shadow Heart questline, and that would have been nice if it had been included in the game. So one thing that I find very lamentable is the lack of Bane content. To be perfectly honest, for me, Bane is the most interesting of the Dead 3. He always has been. He has always been, as befits his status as god of tyranny, strife, and hatred, the most intrigue-driven, the most political, the most manipulative, and plotting. And so, Bainite Cultus. The game featured both Baal and Merkel Cultus rather heavily, but Bane is reduced to Gortash alone, despite the fact that they had full and finished assets for both armor, weapons, and even some events, the Bainites were cut from the final game. So there you have it, Bane, the greatest of the Dead Three getting the shaft. Now this next one you're probably gonna remember from Early Access. Bane, Merkel, and Baal as deities. Clerics were meant to be fully able to select the Dead Three from the list of deities. There were even special dialogues in game for players who played as a paladin and then multi-class at least one level cleric on top and selected one of the dead three. That's very specific and interesting, but yeah, if you had played early access, you could have played a cleric of one of the dead three, but given the nature of the story, I'm not sure how that could have been reconciled with how things went, unless of course you decide to betray everyone and ally with the absolute and the chosen of the dead three. It's very difficult to say. That's a tough one and I'm not sure how I feel about it. The voice of Bane. It's possible to have a brief conversation with Bane but it remains incomplete as the dialogue is unvoiced for some reason. Some more cut content regarding Bane. Real shame, in my opinion, most interesting of the Dead Three by far. Baal and Orin versus the Kresh. An entire Act Two battle was cut in which Baal's forces, led by Orin, attacked the Githyanki Kresh, which led to a fight where you either sided with one or the other, or had a massive three-way fight. This would have been absolutely epic. I think it's tragic that it was not included in the game, and again, it seems to be tied, in my humble opinion, somewhat to level caps and the amount of experience in the game. But by the gods, if this were restored, this would be amazing. And now onto the cut content regarding the endings, and let's all be honest, the endings are really lackluster in this game, and clearly something has been cut, and we will discover just what has been cut. The Withers Epilogue. Withers was meant to narrate an epilogue for the players, to what extent is unsure, but instead, Withers is left with a single event in the entire game. When post-credits roll, he can be seen revealing himself as Jurgle and mocking a mural of the Dead Three. So that would have been cool, Jurgle having a greater narrative role in the game and in the ending overall. Epilogues. Full epilogue cutscenes have been data mined that vary greatly depending on your choice. These were the quote-unquote 17k ending variations that Larian told us about, yet they are completely absent in the final game, leading only to a fade to black scene at the end of the game. Like I said, endings are definitely the worst thing story-wise in this game without question, and the fact that we were missing epilogue cutscenes, which exist in basically every other game you can imagine, be it Baldur's Gate, Pillars of Eternity, Pathfinder, I'm not sure why this was cut, but it definitely needs to be restored without question to make the game whole and complete. Very, very lackluster endings. So now we're on to cut NPCs. Now you might remember, if you visit Auntie Ethel's laboratory or her lair, she has letters from her sisters that she's communicating with, her fellow hags. And this ties directly into something I talked about well over a year ago about hag covens. So, the hag coven in Act 2 and 3. You may notice that accepting Auntie Ethel's help in the first act can lead to a negative effect when fighting hags. You may also notice that despite Auntie Ethel having letters from other hags, she is the only one you encounter. Originally, there was meant to be a full three-act story involving the hag coven, including the mysterious M, who seems to be their leader. That would have been amazing. More fights, more story. Hags are fascinating creatures, but that seemingly was cut from the game, and it's a real shame. Now, some of you from Early Access might remember data mine content about a halfling called Helia, who was a halfling werewolf. We don't really know anything about her, but she was supposed to be in the game. She had assets for sure, and she was cut. So it's hard to make a judgment call on this. It would have been cool to have a halfling werewolf in the game in what capacity, I don't know, as a companion, as just somebody you talk to. It's not entirely clear, but regardless, she was cut. So there's also cut content for items in the game. An early access build contained a crafting bench and it seems originally we were meant to have full access to crafting and enchanting gear of our own, 
for certain systems. While these were cut, the items for them were not. Why items like ingots, gemstones, wood, and other material items appear in game with no use other than as vendor trash. This is incredibly disappointing. Crafting is amazing, it's an interesting feature, and having a lot of things in the game that don't seem to serve a function, because you're playing the game thinking, oh, there's gemstone, what do I need it for? Turns out they actually had plans for these items, but they were canceled. I would love to see this restored, and I hope it is. Belts. Though there is an item slot in game for belts, not a single belt is present in the game as an item. Very strange that belts, girdles, are not in the game. Girdles of giant strength are a tried and true thing in Dungeons and Dragons, just as an example, but where are the belts, where are the girdles, they're not in the game. A somewhat minor thing, but also would be amazing if restored because every RPG has belts in it. Belts are part of RPGs, whether it's Baldur's Gate, whether it's Pillars of Attorney, whether it's Pathfinder, belts are items that you wear and they convey powers upon you. That's just the way it is. So bring back the belts, Larian. And finally, you might remember the ring that Amalem, the mind player in the Underdark, gives you. And you remember it was different in EA. In the EA version of the game, this ring would block your tadpole entirely. It could not grow, it could not grow stronger, and you could not use illithid powers. In the launch version, this ring prevents you from being charmed. By it, Amalem still stating, that it blocked the influence of the Elder Brain Absolute. And this is interesting because that ring could have been a useful plot device if you decide to not go along with the Guardian. If you say, look, I don't need your help. I can achieve independence from the tadpole without your power using this ring. That would have added more layers to the story and I think it's a shame that that was ultimately cut. So that's everything based on this list. And there might be even more cut content. There probably is, but this is what the guy's data mind. And some of it, doesn't bother me, but a lot of it does. Because Act 3 in particular, lacking the upper city, feels lacking. Karlak's ending, Karlak's story, feels lacking. Minthar is just bare bones. Some of these extra fights, this extra content, how amazing would it have been to have a massive three-way fight between Ballas cultists and the Githyanki Kresh with you in the middle of it deciding who you want to side with or alternatively with nobody at all. And that's a good example of why I think the level cap thing was such an issue. There was a lot of cut combat content and then you add Avernus exploring an entire layer the size of the Underdark. And the Underdark is a place where you can get a lot of XP between Grim Forge and the other areas. And then you have potentially at least another level, maybe even two up to level seven spells as a benchmark. And so you can see, maybe that's why they cut the content. We don't really know, but clearly a lot of this, even if it's just exploring the upper city, would have meant that there were more levels to implement, which would have meant more abilities, more spells. I would say 80 to 90% of this I would have liked to have seen implemented. All the companion stuff, the Hag Coven stuff, the upper city, Avernus, the Nautiloid ship as well. Why not? Proper crafting belts, Kazdor, you name it. All this stuff should be in the game because it was meant to be in the game. Now, lords and ladies, there is a silver lining here, and that is what the guy alluded to at the beginning. It is entirely possible that a definitive edition will include these things. These things have been cut out, which will basically make a whole new game, new dialogue, new areas to explore, new levels, maybe up to level 14, which would be amazing. And originally I wanted an expansion, but after reading this, and diving into it myself, also in separate threads, I've come to the conclusion that rather than expansion, this is probably what I'd like. I'd like for all this cut content to be restored, to be part of the base game, the main game, maybe going up to level 13 or 14 ultimately, and I would be satisfied with that. Would I like an expansion beyond? Of course, who wouldn't? But if Larian could restore all the stuff that was mentioned, and as he pointed out, they're known to do so, in Definitive Editions, Larian restores things that were cut in the release version. And we can't be too harsh on Larian. They had a lot to do with this game. And they poured their hearts and souls into it. I want to cut them some slack. But please, if you can, Larian, restore this content. That would just be amazing. I think all of us would appreciate it. Especially the endings. Give us the epilogues. Give us proper endings. Let Withers, let Jurgle narrate things a bit more. Let him be involved in the game a little bit more, tell us a little bit more about the cosmos, that sort of thing. All this stuff would absolutely love it. So this was a long one, but do let me know what you think about this in the comment section. I can't for the life of me think of anyone who'd say, no, 
we don't want any cut content restored. We want the game as it is now because this will fill in the gaps that are currently in the game on a multitude of spectrums, whether it's more combat, whether it's crafting, mostly the story. There are aspects of the story that have glaring holes and they can be filled. Let me know what you think in the comment section about this. And I really appreciate you tuning in. And if you're interested in Baldur's Gate 3, I'd like to invite you to my Discord server where you can talk about Baldur's Gate 3 with like-minded people. And if you like my content, you can leave a like, comment, share, and subscribe as it really helps out the channel. Hit the bell icon to be informed of my videos. It'd be much appreciated. And I will check you out next time. Take care.